advisor and curator specializing in modernism, American Union and European modernism in painting. And I just want to give you a little bit of a definition of what modernism is. Modern, modernist painting basically was the reaction to photography. When photography was introduced in the 1860s in France, painters realized that they couldn't compete with photography in order to be able to represent the world as it is. The Renaissance painters believed that painting should be a window onto the world and they would copy the world exactly as they saw it. But now that photography was doing that, what were the painters going to do? So the first movement to break away from that traditional academic painting was Impressionist painting. And the artists like Monet and Renoir and Raymond Thibault, who worked with the uh, with Monet, who did these two paintings, they decided they were going to focus on the impact of light on color and form, and how it diffuses color and how it diffuses form. Because this is something that you can get in the photograph. So the first Impressionists continued that same movement, but it was almost like Impressionism on steroids. So they would also create, again, the impact of light on color and form, but make it bolder, make the colors more striking, make the, the contrast more important. And these artists who started painting like this were of course not accepted into the traditional art salons, which had judges, and the judges would only allow painters who are academic painters to represent their works in the art salons, which were the fashion uh, they were basically the, the people who set fashion in France. If you were an artist, you wanted your artwork to hang in the salon because that meant that you were an established artist, that you had gotten the approval of the art salon. So they created their own salon called the Salon des Refusés, the salon of, of the artists that were rejected by the salon. And they wore this as a banner because they were very proud of it. With the Impressionist movement also, you had artists that would continue painting in a realistic fashion, but again, the impact of light on color and on form, this mode also was something that they would explore, especially during the Industrial Revolution, when railroad tracks were laid out throughout France, and people could finally get out of the metropolises and go to the countryside and go to the beach, in order to be able to take a break from the smell and the soot and the dirtiness of the city. So this was something that was very impressive. Post-impressionist followed symbolism. Symbolism, again, these are artists that would borrow from previous art movements and it would be a magical, mystical, dreamy kind of uh, representation. This painting here is a view of Venice and you can see that it, it's not a realistic view. You have the gondolas here, you have the masts of the boat that add a rhythmic energy to the composition. You have Santa Maria Maggiore in the background and the canals that take you in. And you have this imaginary, uh, this artist who's used his imagination to create the gondolas using pinks and lavenders and oranges in order to create a pulsating feeling on the surface of the pictorial surface. He also painted it in a form that almost adds a spiritual content to it. And he had the frame made for the painting. So you had, you had uh, Impressionism, Post-Impressionism, and during all of this time, you had artists coming to Paris from all over the world. They were coming from Eastern Europe and Russia to escape political and religious persecution. People like Marc Chagall and Chaim Soutine who were Jews who came to Paris. You had people like Picasso and Modigliani coming to study at the famous art academies in France. And you had Americans like William Merritt Chase, like John Singer Sargent, all of the Augustus Saint-Gaudens. They would all come, study in the art academies, acquire very rigorous technique, stay in Paris for a couple of years, go copy the masters at the Louvre, and then with all of that knowledge, they would head back to where, especially the Americans would head back home, and then they would develop their own painting using the same stylistic 
um, uh, the, style, the style that they picked up in France, but now integrating it into an art that reflected U.S. cities, U.S. landscape, American art. So there was a real cross-pollination between what the Eastern Europeans, the Russian artists would bring to the table, what the Italians and Spanish would also, and they would all rub shoulders at Gertrude Stein's salon, where she would greet the artists, and of course musicians like Stravinsky and Satie, and writers like Ezra Pound and Scott Fitzgerald, and she would have them come into her salon, and the wives of these painters were taken by Alice B. Toklas into the kitchen, and the serious painters would come and sit down with Gertrude Stein, and they would talk art, they would talk literature, they would talk theater. Diaghilev was in Paris in 1908, and he hired a lot of the painters to paint the decor and costumes that were being staged at the Opéra, with music from Stravinsky, with music from Debussy, and so there was a whole cross-pollination of ideas across different, um, across the theater, music, opera, and these artists would contribute to it. You also had a period of time when you had posters that became very popular in France, and posters would flatten the pictorial surface. So you had artists who created what was called the faux movement, and the faux decided they were going to get rid of draftsmanship, they were going to get rid of traditional drawing and painting, and they were going to go attack the canvas with their pigments. So they would take their tubes, they would put them directly onto the canvas, and they would take their the back of their brushes in order to create density and texture, and also the palette light. You could see very thick applications of pigment that would catch the light, and that would add texture and uh, brilliance to the pictorial surface. Now, when the, the uh, art critics saw the Salon in 1905 open in Paris, he said, mon dieu, ce sont des faux. My God, they're wild animals. And the artists thought it was such a great name that they kept the name Faux. So Pierre Dumont was one of the leading faux, uh, founders of Fauvism with Matisse. And we know all about Matisse and how he painted with color. So these are artists also that had their movements that were parallel to the, all of the other art movements. There was futurism also that developed in Italy that uh, really reflected the energy of the Industrial Revolution and the advent of electricity. And we also had the Navi movements, the Navi movements that were like Pia and Bonard, who would flatten the pictorial surface and would really um, paint paintings that you knew were not representational of real life, but they had a very emotive quality. So whatever colors they would bring to their palette, it was, it was there in order to, to give rise to an emotional reaction to their artwork. And you had also the Cubists in 1907. Picasso showed his painting, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, which was a watershed because he basically flattened completely the pictorial surface. He decided objects were three-dimensional, but the picture surface is two-dimensional. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna find a way to be able to represent three-dimensional objects on a two-dimensional surface. So they broke it up and they created planes and they flattened the picture surface. And these are neo-cubists. These are not from the period of cubism, but they have, they've acquired, they learned all of the lessons from cubism. Again, flat surfaces, in cubism, a lot less color contrast, a lot of monochromatic colors, but here you have the greens and the reds and the yellows, the lemon yellows, that create a movement within the composition. Here again, like Brac, the cubists would create compositions made out of spheres, out of cubes, out of rectangles, out of squares, and they would piece them together and the, the public was shocked. They didn't know what to make of it. So it lasted, it wasn't very popular. It lasted till about 1913, 1914, until it evolved into something else. So all of this period, from the Impressionists straight through the Cubism, 
they're called modernists because they broke away from academic painting. And then in 1913, in America, at the Armory, we had the Armory Show. And the Armory Show was the first time American artists and the American public was ever shown what was going on in France. They saw Matisse for the first time, they saw Picasso, they saw Brancusi, they saw Léger. And for them it was a revelation. They had been doing their own thing and all of a sudden they're seeing abstraction, they're seeing uh, minimalism, they're seeing reduction in form, they're seeing how the world had been interpreted, interpreted by all of these modernist movements that were created in Europe. And that's what basically introduced modernism to American art. And the dealers and the artists went back home and they started applying the same lessons to their art. So you have, for example, an American artist who did a depiction of the L train in Chicago. This is called the Ashcan School because it was done during the period, the Great Depression, 1929. But you can see that he's used the lessons that Impressionists has taught him, the diffusion of form and color by light. You have not very much detail here. You have this rapid train crossing the middle of the canvas, so it's got momentum, it adds movement. You have also these curves here that add movement, and you have the light that's here, and then this is all in shape. So they're using, for their subject matter, a very American L train, like the L train in New York as well. And this is what they're showing. They're showing what America is like, what the cities are like, and the grittiness of it as well. So the Americans started using the same palette and the same uh, structure of their compositions, and they created their own movements, and modernism had arrived in America. So from there, you know, we go towards abstraction, where in 1945, after the many artists who were fleeing Nazi Germany were able to come to the United States, including Max Chagall, including Max Ernst, including Peggy Guggenheim, literary people, artists, musicians, they all fled, and they came here and they established themselves and they were working in the major cities on the East Coast. You had big collectors starting to acquire the works. We had, as of 1945, the American Abstract Expressionist Movement, which was really the first all-American movement that was totally influenced by what was going on in this country. Despite the fact that artists like Jackson Pollock had studied in Paris, had gone to the Julien Academy, had come back, but they took the tools that they acquired there, the technique, and they created their own movements. So modernism had officially ended in France and the American modernism was started anew. So this was this is a period that I find fascinating because it's a period of experimentation. It's a color, it's a period of bold color and wonderful compositions. And there are a lot of artists that you know who are very well known that have participated in the movements. And what I do is I select second tier artists who worked with Monet who worked with Matisse. And these are artists that are not well known because people in general just know the names of about 20 artists. But if you get the very best quality of the second tier artists who are no longer alive, and I'm very, very critical about buying only the best quality of an artist's output, then, you know, depending on fad and fashion, and with time, hopefully the works of art will go up in value that's never a sure thing. I always tell people to buy with their heart, buy what resonates with them, and what they can afford. So if you have questions, I'd be more than happy to try to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions about this or any other topic dealing with the art market? Uh, I, love the, I love the portrait here of the man with this. Is this dog, wonderful? Dog or cat? Yeah. yeah. It's it's. I mean, talk about a great. I mean, a really great picture. And you know, it's it's so such a change when you think of the normal portraits are all you know George Washington and the rest. You know, the moral authority is you know he looks, right. and then you have here someone relaxing. You know, I mean, with his pet. 
you know. And this is just, actually painted by an American woman artist whose name was Louise Bush, who migrated to Paris like many other artists, and she most probably was living in a maid's room in a garret. And I just find that she captures the sense of humor of the British, of the, uh, the French bourgeois. You know, the typical French bourgeois with his velvet slippers, and he's elegantly dressed, and he's sitting in this and comfortable and chair and with the pillow behind his head, and he's got this tom cat on his lap, and these, bra these uh, deep blues and blacks contrast with the embers that are coming out of the furnace here. And you can see the room is a garret. I mean, it's... Uh, the, you can see the, the, the pipe coming here, there's a towel hanging, but the composition and the colors are wonderful. You have this yellow light that really draws the art, the eye into the composition. There's some paintings on the wall, there's a book rack, and all of the wallpaper picks up all of the colors that are shown throughout the composition. It's dated 1926. And I, I just love the composition, as you said. Yes, it's great. funny. It's a, and he's not asleep. His eyes are just open. You sort of feel mm -hmm. like, you know, he's thinking about something and he's relaxing and he's, you know, just a little time to himself. But I, I thought it was very unique also. Yeah. So that's how I buy my art is that I've got to have that wow moment, you know, moment. Mm -hmm. it's got to be wow, this is really cool. And then, of course, I do the research, but um, it's, I try to get things that are a little bit atypical. Do you reframe things or do you have any digital frames as you found or does it vary? When, when, uh, the, paint, when the frames are in good condition, for example, this is a, a, a 19th century frame that was in good condition, I try to keep the original frame. This here, yeah, he had the frame made. Uh, this is an original frame. This is an American artist. This is the original frame. This is also the original frame. You can't get a frame like this anymore. So when they're in good condition that they don't need to be repaired too much, I really do try. But 70% of the time, I have to get a new frame. And framing is half the job. Buying the art is one thing. And then really deciding on a frame, it's a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It is work. But you know, I tell people it's like a beautiful woman. Absolutely part of the process. Very right. It it has to be it can't overwhelm the painting. It has to be a natural con you know, continuation, but it's gotta look really good. So any other questions? Nothing? Well I'm here, so please